uh, in this would be happy to try to answer them, be happy to be on the floor to discuss it further, but at such time as we have a vote on this, I would hope that my colleagues would go along with what the committee did and what all of the versions of the bill have written in the past and uh, support the bill as written and, and not approve this amendment. Mr. President. The Senator from Minnesota. I just wanted to thank the Senator from Arizona for his very strong comments and also for his support for this important bill. Uh, as you know, uh, this has uh, uh, come through the uh, Judiciary Committee. Senator Kyle's a member of that committee, as I am as well, and uh, we appreciate uh, uh, Senator Leahy's leadership on this bill as well as all the other senators that have worked so hard on a difficult bill where there are so many interests. Uh, but in the end, what guided us uh, to get through to get this America Invents Act on this floor was the fact uh, that innovation is so important to our com economy, that the protection of ideas uh, in America has what built our economy over the years. So I uh, want to thank Senator Kyle and uh, before we hear from uh, Senator Bingaman who's here on another matter, I just wanted to uh, support uh, Senator Kyle's statements about uh, the need to transition to uh, the first inventor to file system. Uh, as I noted before, we have heard from many small inventors and entrepreneurs who support this transition. Independent inventor Lewis Foreman has said the first to file system will strengthen the current system for entrepreneurs and small businesses. We have heard from nearly 50 small inventors in more than 20 states who share Mr. Foreman's view. I ask that a list of these supporters, as well as Mr. Foreman's letter to the Judiciary Committee in support of the America Invents Act, be included in the record. Without objection. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And I know uh, Senator Bingaman is here to speak. Mr. President. The Senator from New Mexico. Mr. President, I appreciate uh, the chance to speak as if in morning business. Uh, Mr. President, I wanted to uh, <clears throat> take a few minutes to discuss the increasing oil prices that we are observing each day and the evolving situation in the Middle East and in North Africa. From an oil market perspective, the turmoil in the Middle East changed course just over a week ago. And it changed course when Libya joined the group of countries that are witnessing historic popular uprisings. Libya is the first major energy exporter in the region to experience such an uprising. At the moment, as much as a million barrels per day of Libya's total 1.8 million barrels per day of oil production is currently offline continued political turbulence threatening to take even more oil offline before order is restored. It appears that international oil companies, which are responsible for over 40 percent of Libyan oil production, have removed their personnel from the country, and that has led to shutdowns of most fields operated by those international companies. For the moment, it appears that the Libyan national oil companies themselves are mostly continuing to produce and export oil, although there might be some limited production losses in national oil company production as well. There's reason to be concerned that the situation in Libya and throughout the region could become worse before it improves, and I don't know that it's useful to try to predict the most likely outcome for what's occurring in the country, but the reality is that many of the potential scenarios that have been thought of uh, are not good for the stability of world oil flows. Fortunately, Saudi Arabia is widely believed to have enough spare oil production capacity to offset any losses in Libyan oil production. The Saudis have already publicly committed to compensating for any Libyan shortfall and very likely have already ramped up production to make good on that promise. However, the additional Saudi crude oil will not be of the same quality as the lost Libyan barrels of oil, which are light sweet crude. About three quarters of Libyan exports go to Western Europe, and the refineries in Western Europe generally cannot manage the heavier and sour crudes that come out of the Persian Gulf region. 
There will be some crude oil dislocation as higher quality crudes are rerouted to Europe and incremental Saudi barrels of oil ahead for refineries that are able to handle the lower grade oil that they produce. Between the lost production in Libya and the crude oil dislocation associated with additional Saudi production and the prospect of further turmoil in the region, we are now unquestionably facing a physical oil supply disruption that is at risk of getting worse before it gets better. For this reason, I believe it would be appropriate for the President to be ready to consider a release of oil from our strategic petroleum reserve if the situation in Libya deteriorates further. Any additional oil market disturbance, such as turmoil spreading from Libya to Algeria or from Bahrain to Saudi Arabia, would clearly put us into a situation where there would be a very strong argument in favor of a sale from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. But I don't think that high oil prices alone are sufficient justification for tapping the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. I do believe that the announcement of a Strategic Petroleum Reserve sale would help to moderate escalating prices. My recommendation that we stand ready to release oil from the SPRO is squarely in the traditional policy that we have had in our government for SPRO use, going back uh, to the Reagan administration in the 1980s. Testimony before the Committee on Energy and Natural Resources on January 30th of 1984, President Reagan's Secretary of Energy, Donald Hodel, stated that the administration's SPRO policy in the event of an oil supply disruption was to, quote, go for an early and immediate drawdown, end quote. The SPRO would be used to send a signal, a strong signal to oil markets that the U.S. would not allow a physical oil shortage to develop. The SPRO policy carried out during the 1990s, the 1990s, through 1991 Desert Storm operation offers an example of this early and in large volumes policy in action. On January 16th of 1991, President George H.W. Bush announced that the Allied military attack against Iraq had begun, and simultaneously he announced that the United States would begin releasing SPRO stocks as part of an international effort to minimize world oil market disruptions. Less than 12 hours after President Bush's authorization, the Department of Energy released a SPRO crude oil sales notice, and on January 28 of 1991, 26 companies submitted offers. Then Secretary of Energy uh, Watkins noted that, quote, we have sent an important message to the American people that the $20 billion investment they've made in an emergency supply of crude oil has produced a system that can respond rapidly and effectively to the threat of an energy disruption, end quote. According to the analysis posted on the Department of Energy's website during the George W. Bush administration, quote, the rapid decision to release crude oil from government control stocks in the United States and other OECD countries helped calm the global oil market and prices began to moderate. World oil markets remained remarkably calm throughout most of the war due largely to the swift release of the strate strategic petroleum reserve oil. In recent years, the policy signals surrounding SPRO use have not been as clear. Some SPRO sales were criticized as efforts to manipulate oil prices. The SPRO was then ignored during other oil supply disruptions, including simultaneous oil supply disruptions due to a strike in Venezuela, political turmoil in Nigeria, and the initiation of the current war in Iraq. I believe the Reagan administration set the correct course for SPRO decision making. The current administration would be well served in considering that example. 
and should be ready, in my view, to make a decision to calm world oil markets should the threat to world oil supplies increase in the coming days and weeks. Mr. President, I uh, yield the floor. Suggest the absence of a quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Okaga.
President. Senator from Ohio. I ask that the calling of the quorum be suspended. Without objection. I ask uh, permission of the Senate to address uh, the Senate as if in morning business. Without objection. Earlier today, the Finance Committee held a hearing to discuss the serious problems of fraud in Medicare and Medicaid. Over the last nine years, the Finance Committee has held more than 20 oversight hearings dealing with Medicare and Medicaid fraud. These hearings highlighted the flaws in how the federal government administers Medicare and Medicaid. They also stressed the need to create disincentives for those who seek to defraud these vital programs. Every dollar lost to Medicare or Medicaid fraud is a dollar that's not available for beneficiaries. And of course, we ought to be very cognizant of that considering the impending uh, bankruptcy of Medicare. Uh, in 2009, the federal government spent $502 billion on Medicare and $379 billion on Medicaid. It is estimated between $40 billion and $70 billion was lost to fraud that year. However, officials from the Department of Health and Human Services and the Department of Justice announced last month that their health care fraud prevention and enforcement efforts recovered $4 billion of fraud. So compare that $4 billion to the $44 to $70 billion. It means that we still have a very long way to go. When it comes to public programs like Medicare and Medicaid, it is clear that the federal government needs to be more effective in combating waste, fraud, and abuse. The federal government has simply made it too easy for bad actors to steal from each of these programs. It says a lot when you hear that organized crime has moved into health care fraud because it's more lucrative than organized crime. Medicare and Medicaid also attract more criminals because the profits of fraud greatly outweigh the consequences if you get caught. And then there are those who don't even get caught. Taxpayers' dollars should only go to bona fide providers and medical suppliers. But the reimbursement system is set up so that the federal government pays first and asks questions later. In other words, the system is based on a program that you call pay and chase system. Over the years, Congress has given the executive branch more authority to improve enforcement of fraud, waste, and abuse laws. During health care reform, Senator Baucus and I developed a bipartisan set of legislative proposals to combat fraud, waste, and abuse. Many of these proposals are in the bill that I introduced in the last Congress, S-2964, the Strengthening Program Integrity and Accountability and Health Care Act, and many were included even in the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. These provisions did not draw opposition from either side of the aisle. Tackling fraud, waste, and abuse in health care is one of the areas where there is widespread agreement, but our work does not end with the passage of legislation. Congress needs to keep the pressure on federal officials to do everything possible to prevent and stop fraud. There is also more that Congress must do in ways of reform to enhance the government's ability to fight this fraud. We need to ensure that phantom doctors, pharmacies, and durable medical equipment suppliers cannot simply bill Medicare millions of dollars in just a few months and then get out of town scot-free. Health and Human Services and the Center for Medicare, uh, Medicare and Medicaid Services need then to use the tools already available to them to make sure that claims are legitimate before they're paid. But even with all of that, we must remain vigilant in our oversight efforts, which is the constitutional responsibility of the legislative branch of government. Because tomorrow's criminals 
will find ways to get around the laws and regulations that we put in place today. That's why I've introduced this Strengthening Program Integrity and Accountability and Health Care Act of 2011. This bill contains the remaining proposals from S-2964 of the last Congress, the uh, proposals that are necessary to enhance the government's ability to combat Medicare and Medicaid fraud. It builds on reforms that we made in that last Congress. The bill would require the Secretary of Health and Human Services to issue regulations to make Medicare claims and payment data available to public similar to other federal spending disclosed through www.usaspending.gov. This website lists almost all federal spending, but it doesn't include Medicare payments made to physicians. That means virtually every other government program, including even some defense spending, is more transparent or responds to the citizens' right to know than spending by the Medicare program. And so that differential between defense spending and most other government programs and what we allow the public to know about the Medicare tax dollars being spent is too big of a gap and one that we should not tolerate anymore because a taxpayer dollar spent on Medicare isn't any different than the public's right to know about a taxpayer dollar spent on uh, uh, defense programs or let's say even for this senator with my background in farming and participating in a family farm operation public can read in the newspapers of Iowa as they can for every state the amount of money that a certain senator or I shouldn't say senator, a certain farmer, gets from the farm program. It's all taxpayers' dollars. Now, in addition, this bill also goes on to create an additional, a national clearinghouse of information so that we can better detect, prevent, and thereby deter medical identity theft. This is about the federal government sharing information it already has in ways that protect the taxpayer and work against those defrauding the system. The bill would also change federal laws that require Medicare to pay providers quickly, regardless of risk, fraud, uh, regardless of the risk of fraud, waste, and abuse. Under current law, the government is required to make payments for what's called a clean claim within 14 to 30 days before interest accrues on the claim. Now that is not enough time for the limited number of Medicare auditors to determine if a claim is legitimate before a payment has to be made. The result is that this, what we call prompt payment rule, requiring that Medicare pay bad actors first and ask questions later which leads to that pay and chase system I previously mentioned. So this bill would add to the tools that Congress provides to the executive branch last year to prevent fraudulent payment on the front end. It would extend the time that payments must be made by the Secretary of Health and Human Services determines, uh, if the Secretary determines there's a likelihood of fraud, waste, and abuse. In addition, the bill would expand Health and Human Services Inspector General's authority to exclude an individual from participating in the federal health care program. Now, I'd like to give you an example. The, Fed the Inspector General would be able to exclude an individual if the individual had ownership or control interests in an entity at the time the entity engaged in misconduct such as health care fraud. Now, I know that's common sense to uh, the taxpayers of America, but it's not something that the Inspector General can do today. I still have other areas that my bill addresses. 
and that is in the area of illegal, unapproved drugs. Just last week, the Los Angeles Times reported that the Food and Drug Administration is struggling to keep unapproved drugs off the market. It reported that, quote, in many cases, the agency doesn't even know what the drugs are or where they are, end of quote. This is another example of how the federal reimbursement system creates an incentive for bad actors to get around the rules. In this case, those rules are the Food and Drug Administration requirements for putting a drug on the market. Medicaid pays until the Food and Drug Administration identifies a drug or class of drugs as not approved for marketing and then taking formal action. Under such circumstances, the federal government doesn't even have the option, even the option, to chase after previous payments. My bill would stop such payments unless the state Medicaid program first verifies with the Food and Drug Administration that the drug is being legally marketed. Now again, that may sound like common sense, but it's something that can't be done without change of law. The changes I'm proposing would go a long way to deter those who would defraud our health care system. It also would provide greater protection to the taxpayers. Fighting fraud, waste, and abuse in Medicare and Medicaid is vital to the sustainability of each of these programs of Medicare and Medicaid. My bill will help add to the reforms that we passed last year. It will fix some of the blatant problems that incentivize and reward waste, fraud, and abuse. Mr. President, over 100 million Americans rely on Medicare and Medicaid for health insurance. Right now, these programs, as we all know, every member of the Senate knows, and most of the public knows, that these programs are on an unsustainable path. My bill takes necessary steps to move these programs towards sustainability, and I urge my colleagues to support this legislation and to help me by co-sponsoring it. I yield the floor, and I would uh, suggest the absence of a quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Conk.
Indiana. Quorum call. Without objection. Thank you, Madam President. Madam President, I rise in strong support of the Lee Amendment, which is a sense of the Senate that this body and the House should pass a constitutional amendment requiring a balanced budget. Madam President, clearly, I think in every American's mind, our top domestic challenge is to get hold of our fiscal situation, to move us to a sustainable path, to tighten our belt in the federal government, just like every American family has been doing for many years in this recession. We're making a start, a real but modest start, in terms of this year's budget. And I was happy that the Senate followed the lead of the House and passed a two-week CR today that has substantial cuts, the exact level of cuts as the House passed for the rest of the fiscal year. I support that important start in terms of this year's budget. And of course, we need to finish the job by passing a spending bill for the entire rest of the fiscal year with that level of cuts or more. And that's a start, but it's only a start. The other thing I think we need to do, Madam President, is create, reform a structure that demands, that demands that Congress stay on that path to a balanced budget until we get there. And I believe the most important thing we can create to demand that, a straitjacket for Congress, if you will, is a balanced budget constitutional amendment. And unfortunately, Madam President, I think Congress time and time again over years and decades has proved that we need to put Congress in that straitjacket if we're going to ever get to a sustainable fiscal situation, a balanced budget. Madam President, this isn't some academic debate. This is about the future of our kids, our grandkids, and our immediate future because we could be put into economic chaos at any time because of our untenable fiscal situation, because 40 cents of every dollar the federal government is spending is using borrowed money, and so much of that money borrowed from the Chinese. This is about whether we're going to remain the freest, most prosperous country in human history. And this is about 